Well, good evening, everybody. So my name's Andrew, and uh, I've been a somewhat irregular visitor to these evenings. I would describe myself as a fairly casual Ember developer over the last 18 months, um, and consider this talk as somewhere between uh, a demonstration of, of an idea, uh, but not so much necessarily for demonstrating the techniques as an opportunity for group therapy to see if, if this actually is a sort of sensible thing to do by, by any measure and if, if I've chosen an at all sensible way to do it. Um, so the title here is First Step Towards Polymorphic Validation with Ember and Rails. Perhaps I just put polymorphic in because it makes everything sound better. Um, and uh, as, as a bit of background, my sort of computing background, I don't know how many this aligns with, started with Amiga Basic circa 1992, which I just discovered today was actually made by Microsoft when I looked up the YouTube video, so that was a bit of a surprise. And then graduating to Visual Basic 4 in about 1995, which gave me endless, endless hours of fun. Now, my day job, I'm, I'm not, a, not a developer at all. My, my day job is a, a paediatric doctor, and that does give me the opportunity to interact with lots of forms of technology. Um, principally telephones from the 1980s which you can create a fairly handy hands-free kit from uh, when you're on the telephone to IT support for 30 minutes waiting for an answer because your computer's broken um, and, uh, and fax machines which we still make an awful lot of use of so there you go uh, in the words of Ron Burgundy uh, it is amateur hour so to outline the talk I'm going to introduce <coughs> the, the general pattern for validation in Rails and Ember using existing tools, uh, state the problem that, that, that I've encountered, my proposal to solve it, and then we can think of the limitations and, and future directions it could go in if it isn't a completely mad idea. So for validation, we all know that we need server-side validation first and foremost because we can't trust anything that comes from the client. But the whole point of tools like Ember is trying to allow us to have uh, very responsive client-side validation that allows people to know whether they're entering the right things before they ever get to the submit button and that reduce network traffic possibly. Um, so ideally, we'd like both. Now at the moment, <coughs> if you're using a combination of Rails and Ember, which is very popular, then you may be validating your server-side models using active record validations. Uh, for which we just run these simple validation methods within the class definition and can incorporate quite a range of different types of validation. And I think actually, I've no, I mean, I, I, I got into Rails probably about eight years ago, but I don't think I'd ever really understood Ruby properly, and it was only when doing this I began to realise that I was actually simply running a command with that statement, that it wasn't some sort of magical, magical declaration. So there you go. Um, and then in Ember, we can use Ember validations, which unsurprisingly is based on active record validations and therefore looks very similar. Significantly in this case, actually, the validations is applied as uh, an extension to a component or a controller, not to a model directly. Um, and so we simply include the Ember validations uh, component, and then we can give a hash of validation strategies which will be applied and as far as I can tell the way that they're defined is almost identical to, a, to the way that they are in Rails validations. So the problem statement is that it requires us to declare our validations on the server side and the client side. Now that's not such a big deal when you only have one set of validation rules per model type because we already do that for models. We declare our models on the client, we declare our models on the server. We don't get too upset about that, although it does cause problems if you want to change your model specifications and you forget to do one or the other side. So it just multiplies our work by two. Every time we want to define or add a validation, we simply define it on both ends. So maybe it's not such a big problem. But what about models where we have some sort of conditional or type-specific validation? And I think the key example, the classic example for this is a scenario where you have custom forms, where you have a, a set, an arbitrary set of forms that are defined within a database by a form object, and then you can fill those forms in, attaching sort of arbitrary data, perhaps, I mean, in, in my case, using Postgres, where you can uh, then have a JSON column to just contain a, a hash that would represent the filled form. Um, and in that case, actually, the set of validation rules will be specific for each for each form. 
and what we want to do is be able to define that in a way that will run on both the client and the server. So perhaps actually the problem I'm trying to solve is not necessarily the problem in the simple case, but the problem in the, the harder case. But what I hope to reach by the end is a suggestion that maybe there's a way to also solve the first case once you've done the second. So this is the basic example of the custom form idea. So we have a model for a form, which has a title, and then it has a definition, which for which in this case I've made a new transform called JSON, and that will contain a JSON hash which describes in whatever means you describe the structure of a form and the content that it can, that, 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 yeah, so the structure of a form, input elements and things like that. And then we can have filled forms, which are the forms as filled in by the user. So every filled form will be linked to a form. It may have a user or any other set of attributes, but crucially it will have a form data hash. And so for every, for every form element that's defined in the model, we would then define what the user has inputted into that form in the filled form. Now, have I explained that, <laughs> have I explained that clearly? So, uh, good, okay, I'm seeing some nods, excellent. Um, now, this is the transform that I use for, for JSON. I think I nicked it when I randomly searched on Google. I think the simplest one I've seen literally just sort of passed through the value unchanged either way. This one, I think, does a little bit of munging for reasons that I never really paid much attention to, but it seemed to work. Um, and it's never caused me problems. Um, and then this is an example of a form. So I've already told you that I'm medical by background. So this was actually thinking about forms for referral forms for a, some sort of medical record system where we could have a form that's for an inpatient physiotherapy referral. And I've made up my own definition structure here where a definition is an array of, uh, of hashes, each of which defines an element type. Um, the key for that element what input type is going to represent it, and the label. Uh, and then th there's, I've got code, which I'm not going to go into, which then helps turn that into a, into a form to display and to fill in. So I think that <coughs> the general specification for this problem is that, or the, the way I'd like to go about it, is not to have to write new validation tools and simply to couple existing validation tools to avoid as much extra work as possible. Um, and the whole thing has to be sort of completely runtime, um, so it can't involve, for example, uh, Rails generating uh, some Ember code for you to put in, uh, and then every time you change the forms, regenerating that and updating your client-side code. So that then gave me, I think, three main parts to the problem. The first part was that actually now, instead of declaring my validation details somewhere in code, I now simply want to store them and serve them up. And then I need to allow validation in Rails and validation in Ember to be dependent upon the stored validation rules. So the handy thing here is that the format for Ember validation is already JSON, so it seemed a, a completely straightforward step to use the Ember validation format as my, as my storage format. And then in order to allow data-driven validations in Rails, um, I had a, a think about this and I, think I looked, and I'm not good enough at Ruby to sort of open up the internals of active record validations and work out how I could sort of automatically call the right things to set these up at runtime, other than <coughs> by uh, working out how to do metaprogramming, which seemed to be a bit easier, where you actually alter the uh, definition of a class at runtime, and a bit of trial and error made that work. And then similarly, we need to allow data-driven validations in Ember, so for which I assumed I would simply need, instead of, as you saw before, declaring the validations hash statically uh, in the code, simply loading the validation hash onto the controller or the component at runtime. Oops, I went too far. Um, so this is an example now of a form to which I've now added a validations hash in the database. And the validations hash, as it looked like before, defines a, a key and then has, a, has two criteria here. I mean, those two are a bit pointless because if the length, oh no, if, no, that, no they, yeah, so you have to fill it in and you have to have a length of, of, of at least five. So on the rail side, <coughs> this was how I ended up doing it. It took, like most of my programming, it took quite a lot of searching on Google uh, and looking at, looking at people who know about how to do Ruby to get it to work. And I'm gonna go through it uh, 
bit by bit because it's not that well commented um, and otherwise I would just be standing here and, and you would read it and that would be a bit boring. Um, so a filled form belongs to a form, that's what tells us the structure the contents should take. And instead of declaring any validations directly, we simply say once a filled form object is initialized on the server, uh, we're going to set up the validations. And it's not, a ra it's not obviously not a Rails evening, so we're not going to focus on this too much. But we then load the form definition and load the form validations. Now, the next problem I encountered is that active record validations, as far as I could tell, it wasn't very easy to validate something that was a, was a hash attached to your object. It would validate sort of first level properties and not necessarily sort of other things attached to that, or at least it didn't seem straightforward. So what I first needed to do was actually proxy the form data hash. So that instead, of, instead of the filled form having a hash, which was a key value store of all the things, I wanted to translate that into a series of direct properties on the object. So essentially for each of the form, uh, for the form keys, I define a singleton method which will have the names, name form underscore and then the key. So that gives me a slightly namespace safe way of doing that. So by the end of this little do loop, I have uh, now translated all of the elements of the form that were defined through a hash into direct properties prefixed by form underscore on the, the filled form. And now I can trick Rails validations or active record validations into validating these. And in this case, it took me a while to work. I still can't work out quite why it is that one. It, I, I always thought it would be instance, de, instance eval as the way of sort of applying something to the class. But it turned out it was class eval. And this essentially reopens this instance of the class alone. And then for each key, um, I simply add a validation rule, converting the, the namespaced version of the form key to a symbol, and then deeply symbolizing the the deeply symbolize, I should stand further back, I can't point it, I'm casting shadows, deeply symbolizing the, the hash that describes the validation. So you can see there, so reason with presence true and length minimum five simply gets turned into the command below, validates form reason, presence true and length minimum five. I still don't know if that was a sensible way to do it, but it seems to work. And it didn't involve me writing much code and uh, I'll look forward to, to any critiques later. But does it make vague sense? Good, I saw some more nodding. Excellent. It's vaguely interactive now. I'm getting nodding audience feedback. Um, so on the Ember side, which we're more interested in here, I thought it would be really straightforward. I thought, oh, it, at the time of initialising uh, the, the model, all I need to do is, is sort of load the validations hash and it will all work. It wasn't quite that simple. So this is the form model. So now I've added a new, a new uh, parameter to the forms model called validations. Um, the first thing to, to realise is that that contains the validations with the raw names of the, of the keys. So the, the name is reason in this case. But actually, on the filled form object, similarly to the, similarly to the, to the Rails side, actually the reason property is actually on the form data hash. So it would be addressed as form data dot reason. Um, now, Ember validations actually handles addressed variables very easily so you can validate things that aren't sort of simple properties of the direct object in question so validating a sort of form data dot reason a, a key on a hash is absolutely fine so what we then do is have a dependent <coughs> a computed variable from the validations which essentially takes each of the keys in validations and prepends form data dot uh, so that we now have a, a new validations hash defined on the basis of the first one, which refers to the data as it will be seen in Ember. So this was my first failing attempt, which was why not save time and just use a binding? So that the component that I have here, which I've just named here, fill custom form, mixes in Ember validations, um, and uh, this will be given the property of the form that you're filling in. Um, as, as the property form in the, through, the, through the component syntax. Um, and so I thought well, I could just do this. I could say validations binding and bind it to the client validations on the attached form. That didn't work, um, probably because of the way that, um, that Ember validations accesses the validations hash at runtime, but I don't understand. So I tried again. This time I said, okay, well, let's just do it manually. So on initializing the component, 
what we'll do is we'll just statically set validations to the computed client validations from the form. That also didn't work, and I suspect it may be because my initialize doesn't get there quite quickly enough, again, for reasons that I wouldn't understand because I don't understand Ember internals well enough. So then I thought, well, <coughs> can we do it another way? And it turned out it worked. It's a bit hacky, and it takes things into the handlebars templates that I'd rather not. But what I've done, actually, is, is the fill custom form component. When I include it, I give it the form. I give it the filled form. I also cheat, and I actually directly give it the form validations. For whatever reason, that seems to work. Um, but perhaps it would be better for me, actually, to spend a bit more time understanding the internals of Ember validations. And then we might work out a better way to, to hijack it at runtime. So that's it, really. That's the, so, so <coughs> the one achievement I think I've managed is some sort of almost polymorphic data-driven and type-specific validation for objects. I don't know if that's too niche to be of use to anyone else, but I think, I think you know, people having you know, sort of data-defined objects is not, not that uncommon. Um, and, uh, but the limitations. So at the moment, it's got no capacity for handling non-polymorphic validations either uniqueness, because it's not really possible to do it on the client, or ones that you may only wish to do on the server or the client for valid reasons. I haven't really gone at all into how you would then deal with errors, merging errors on the client and the server. In a sense, it should be quite straightforward, because most of the time, if you, well, if you get a client error, you won't submit. If you don't get a client error, you will submit. And if your client's not trying to trick you by hacking into you, then it should validate on the server side unless it's a uniqueness constraint or something like that. But maybe there, maybe there are issues there that, <coughs> that need to be solved. And the slight complexity there is that the Ember validations errors come on the, on the, on the component you're programming, but the, but the uh, server side errors actually come directly onto the, the model. So they're stored in different places. Custom validations would be a whole another barrel of fun because then you're actually having to write executable code. So you'd have to either, you'd potentially have to define your custom validations once on both sides before you could use them. But um, yeah, there, perhaps there's, there's other ways. Um, and it was suggested to me when I chatted to someone here previously that there are efficiency problems with metaprogramming in Ruby. So whether this would have problems with scaling, I don't know. Where could, where could I go with this? <coughs> well, I think, there could be ways of trying to overcome the limitations, working out ways of defining custom validations in both JavaScript. Uh, well, well, I mean, one thought, and this would probably be an awful one, but if you could define them in JavaScript only, serve them over the wire, um, and run them on the server side with exec.js, but I think that would probably be horrific. I don't know. Um, and that, but then going back to the first problem, which is the fact that actually even in the simple case, we still have to declare our validations on the server and the client side, can we take this solution and backport it onto standard validations so that we only have to define our validations in one place? Um, and, and if we were to do that, <coughs> I think the neatest way would actually be to, to move away from storing them in, whether in the code or whatever, as some sort of JSON hash, but actually defining them through the active record validations and then having a, a single validation route on a, on a, on a server which the, for which then you could query for any given model and get the validations hash for that. But that would, that would require some way of interrogating a model to find out what validations have been applied to it. Now, I'm sure there's a way to do that. It would just require looking it up. But again, is that a good idea or not? I don't know. But anything that saves me writing more lines of code in the future, I usually think of as a, as a good thing. And if, if it turns out from this that actually it isn't a terrible idea, and this isn't an awful way to do it, then uh, maybe it would be a sensible thing to to share, but we'll, we'll see what you think. And I won't be upset at all if you tell me it's a mad idea. Um, so thank you very much for your, your time and your patience. I hope it made vague sense. I hope it was slightly interesting. Thank you. We've time for questions if anyone has Ooh. any. And the answer's probably don't know. Yes. Um, just wondering, uh, I haven't worked with validations, but mm. how does it work on the other side? So is it actually, do you find pass a function or is it a data of um, so I guess if I go back to really near the beginning, I mean, again, I actually, I confess, I haven't used it much. I just, this was a problem I came up with fairly early in my course of using them. So essentially, you, you apply it to a component, 
and then <laughs> you, you tell it what to validate and how to validate it, and then it gives you the methods to do that validation so you can then check is this valid or not, and then make logical decisions about what to do with it if someone presses submit in that case. It will also validate content live, and so it will update a hash of errors live as you enter into a form, meaning that you can then display errors live. I mean, I've got, if I take it off uh, full screen, the system that I'm sort of doing in my spare time. The example here is an inpatient referral for which we choose physiotherapy inpatients. You can see actually before I've even started typing, it's validated uh, and said it can't be blank and it's too short. So I mean, again, that, which is something you usually want to change in practice because you don't want to validate immediately. And it will, it will update that validation uh, live. Um, I've tricked this, so actually if you press submit, it will genuinely submit it. And then the server comes back and says the same. But I think I'm misinterpreting the server hash, which is why it appears on, on both things. So you can see it repeats the error twice, which is why I did say that I haven't solved the problem of dealing with, with both errors at once. So it's, it's quite a nifty and straightforward way of doing validations. And then, of course, once you link it with all your CSS and everything, you can make everything look whizzy and nice like the people at British Gas did yeah. very quickly. I don't know if anyone was there for that. That was good. Mm -hmm. So can I continue? Of course. Sorry, yes. Yeah, someone else. Yeah. Oh, okay, you go first. I'll ask. Okay, we'll come back. Uh, did you consider uh, building a, some sort of like a build step to, uh, like, I don't know, like define relations in JSON and then generate the JavaScript and uh, Ruby code, you know, like a watch task, you know? Yeah, so, so that crossed my mind. <laughs> but I think going back to sort of earlier in the talk, if this was just for statically typed models, that would, that would work perfectly. Um, yes, you, you, you know, some sort of build step that then means that you define it once in whatever way, and you then produce the static Ruby and JavaScript code for that, which is then part of your project. I think that would be absolutely fine. Um, in this case, because it was first, that my first problem was actually with a model that has different validation rules dependent on which form you're filling in. Um, and, and those could be defined at runtime by users. So there would be nothing to stop in this system a user defining a new type of form. So actually, it, it had to be stored in the database. And it has, to be, uh, it has to be turned into executable code at runtime. But yeah, for the, for the simple case, that something like that would work. Mm. Um, so you were saying that it's you would have to, um, or you're trying to avoid the case of um, serving up code and then having to update that code again. So, so, you know, yes. So can you not have an API where you get that, those val that validation? That is but, <laughs> so I think, yeah, so, so coming back, so I guess that it's just keeping the two problem domains separate. The, the problem domain that I actually went in depth into here yeah. was was a sort of a per object validation, where every filled form will have a different set of validation rules depending on the form that's being filled in, and that those are defined in a database and they can change. So that actually takes us a little bit beyond the usual problem of simply having a model for a user which has a set of rules which you want to apply on the client and on the server all the time. So, it's a, so this is saying actually you have, you have dynamic validation rules. But then what I tried to bring in at the end was the idea of, yes, back, back porting this to the more simple case, in which case one solution would be, yes, you simply do it all statically at compile time, and you simply compile your validation rules. But what you're talking about is that you don't have a dynamic solution. You have just two set of rules. One rule is for the data object, another rule is for form. So for example, you define like five uh, object types, like a patient, Yeah, in the database, yeah. And, and still it's a static. Um, I, I may, maybe we, I don't know if we differ slightly in the, the way we're defining static and dynamic, but I think for me it's dynamic because while the server is running and while the client is running, if I change in the database the validation rule, so this, this is served up from the database, yes, yeah? so this is form number two, served up through a, a request to the server. So if I change this on the database and the client requests from me form two and I've changed it, it will get a new set of validation rules and those will then be uh, applied when the form is filled in. So I, I mean dynamic in that sense as it's not part of the static code of the website. Okay. Mm. Framework, the models. 
Right. So you can define, in that sense, a, a, a form, which may well, at the end of the, you know, generate a model on the, ser on the server side, but it doesn't have to, in that sense, correspond exactly yes. to the model. Um, and you could, I, I'm not sure, it depends, depends uh, it's been a while, but um, could maybe sort of customise these things at runtime. So that, and if anything, that general approach would be easier to implement. Ah, I see, obvious, yes. Obvious reasons. Um, the other thing is, I mean, it just occurs to me, you could think about what's something like the, having a kind of factory object that would, you give it some validation rules, and then that does the mad meta programming on your Ruby class, Ruby active, active uh, yes. record model, and returns you a custom sort of singleton class of that active record model. Right. And then you could use that to do the validation rather than having it all in a big method. Yes. Whether, yeah. whether that would actually work, play nicely with all the other magic going on that different active error, I have no idea. No. I, I mean, <laughs> I guess the, the, the first easy step is simply to take that function yeah. out into a, into a I, I forget what the version of, what do you call a mixin in Ruby? I don't know. It, call it, there you go. To take it out into a library so that, you know, because at the moment this would just be copied and pasted across yeah. modules. Yeah. Yes. Do you try using a computer property for validations? I don't know. Uh, you as, well, uh, uh, do you mean that? Because in this case, I did, I guess, validations binding. So that should well, set you up. Put validations uh, and, put up um, and provide a function. If you were telling oh, me, I, I don't know. I don't know how to validations for code. Right. Actually, probably if you're from data equals Ember computed alias build form dot form data. Right. And is that distinct to doing a binding? Yeah. Uh, okay, yes, fine. Right. Fine. Oh, well, maybe that would have worked. Right. Yes. Is it? My, so I would almost completely, I guess, com almost completely surely that it's probably not promise aware because all of the examples I've seen of Ember validations are all about using it statically. Um, but uh, yeah, that might be. Okay. Great. Oh well, that that would that would make things much better rather than putting it in the template. Do you do you want no? Oh. Oh, right. um, yeah. So two things like um, a common pattern in Rails is to use view adapters. Right. To get all like the form logic in there, or to have a separate class that inherits an active model. Right. It behaves a bit like a model, but it's not an active record model. So right. There. But the question I want to ask is, where do you actually define the validations then? In the database. So did you have like an inventory just like stick in the seeds file and then? No, so this is just so 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 that the, the for, each form is a row in the forms table, okay. um, and it has an ID, it has a title, it has a definition, which it, it's it, it's this is Postgres, so I can have a column that's a JSON object. So the the form the form is de defined has a structure that's defined on the. So No, well, no, because it's just data, so it's not it's not changing the structure of the database. It's so to, to change it to change a form's validation rules is simply to change a, a field in the oh. database. To add a new form is just to add a new row to the database. Um, but I was interested in the mention of, of active record views because my imagination is that that because that's that's when you're using Rails as you're serving up the web pages for more sort of well, yeah, classical work. What I've done is if the form is starting to get like too complicated for the model, then yes. I Yes. Adapters, I see. Then you call that, and that has a model. And yes. Record model, and yes. All the logic tied to the form is just on a view adapter rather than a model. I see. So my suspicion is that perhaps might not apply so much in this case because Ember is doing because yeah, so yeah. much of the form stuff is taken over. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Oh well, thank you very much for your time. One more question. Oh, one more question. Yes. When do you find time to do all this? Um, oh, well, I should, my, the last job, I, so I haven't touched this for two months, which is why I, so, so all of today was spent reminding myself what I'd done, um, because my last job was, uh, was not so busy. Actually, it was fairly, it was good. It, was, uh, it, it didn't stress me out too much. It wasn't too many hours, so I actually did have a lot of time sitting on the sofa doing programming. For the last two months working at St. Mary's, that hasn't happened at all. <laughs> well, thanks again, Andrew. Thank you.